Thank you to everyone for returning from a very generous lunch and very tasty too. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Nigel Alwyn from Barbados in the Caribbean, who I've worked with for eight years now. Nigel was a physician and medically trained epidemiologist who has 20 years of research experience in the UK and elsewhere. Most of his research has been on control, prevention of burdens of diabetes and cardiovascular disease in low and middle income countries, also ethnic differences in CBD risk in the UK. He developed rapid appraisal methods uh, for sub-Saharan Africans to look at NCD service readiness, so response to the burgeoning NCD epidemics. He's worked with the International Diabetes Federation, developing methods for the diabetes atlas and with WHO in Geneva and led on the social determinants of diabetes for that global module. He also established the WHO Collaborating Centre for Diabetes in Newcastle from 2006, out of which the original MedChance um, ECFP7 funded grant arose. So it's, it's largely Nigel's influence why we're still here today. And that's, um, a wonderful long-standing collaboration. In 2010, he moved to Barbados in the Caribbean, uh, which is another part of the region with a very high prevalence of diabetes. And since then, he's been working on health of the nation surveys for diabetes and CBD, and policy analysis across 20 Caribbean countries. And I'd, try to, I'd just like to hand it to uh, um, Thank you very much, Julia, and uh, I really must thank the organisers hugely. It's a great honour to be asked to come here because I feel in many ways the least qualified or one of the least qualified people to be standing on this podium because I haven't worked in this region. Uh, I've only worked with this region when I first back four and a half years since I've been based. Better do this one. Yeah. Okay. Across countries uh, taking into account any age differences. 
And the darker, the, the red areas are the most highly prevalent, greater than 12%. The purple, um, uh, one down from that, 9 to 12%. And you'll see, of course, this is very familiar to everyone here, that within this region, the a very high, in fact, in many ways, the highest concentration, if you look at groups of countries, are high prevalence countries. The Caribbean, which is here, you'll see Barbados is in get dots on the map, but as I'll show you, also has a very high prevalence. And so when you look at just percentage prevalence by region, you'll see that in the Middle East and um, um, North African region, this is the IVF, international diabetes regions, comes out top, if you like, as that um, dubious honor. Uh, North America and the Caribbean is uh, second in terms of this hierarchy, although if you took out North America, the Caribbean would be a bit higher, I think very similar to to Mina. And then you'll see these other regions, Afro, Euro, um, South America, and Central America, and Southeast Asia, the Western Pacific. And that, of course, has a huge impact. Uh, it has a huge morbidity impact. Um, one way to get a, a, an estimate of the impact is to look at mortality, which is clearly the tip of the iceberg in terms of the impact of diabetes. And that is hard to do because many de deaths at certain nation masses differ over time between countries as to whether or not diabetes is registered as an underlying cause. But one way to do that is to look at attributable mortality. In other words, look at the excess mortality that people with diabetes have compared to people without. And when you do that, these are estimates from the IDF Atlas. And I'm, I'm going to do this because it's easier. So and then when you do that, um, you, you come up with this figure that um, roughly one in eight deaths in Lena, for example, this may well be an underestimate, roughly one in eight deaths in North America and Lena are attributable to diabetes, are diabetes related. And actually the difference is great between men and women for this, and this is, and you'll see here the statistical in Lena region. You'll see this is the percentage of deaths estimated to be attributable to diabetes by age group for women and for men. And the reason for this isn't that there's more diabetes, a high prevalence of diabetes in women compared to men, it's roughly the same, but because the relative risk of death in, for women with diabetes compared to women without diabetes is greater than it is in men, so for men without diabetes compared to men without diabetes. So it differentially impacts upon women in that sense. Most diabetes, 90%, 95%, depending on the region, is type 2 diabetes. And the risk factors for type 2 diabetes are well understood. It has now been very well studied. And there are still things to understand in terms of, for example, the differences between ethnic groups. But in fact, in any population that's been studied, what comes out very really strongly is this combination of overweight and obesity and physical inactivity. And there are other factors, and tobacco smoking, for example, is one, which may well be important, particularly in high smoking prevalence areas. Uh, where there's consistent uh, relative risk for um, increased incidence of type 2 diabetes. And then there are, of course, non-modifiable risk factors, factors that can't be changed. And just on the overweight and obesity, it's well known, and should be very well known to many people here, that there's this interaction, if you like, with um, abdominal obesity. So for a given body mass index, if you tend to put weight on in the abdomen, then that increases the risk further of, um, of type 2 diabetes. And this is uh, a nice example here from Cobalt Southern US. And just, if we just look at the BMI 30, you'll see that those with the waist circumference of less than 90 centimeters compared to um, 90 to 100 compared to greater than 100, there's a stepwise increase in risk. So body mass index and then within body mass index, the importance of abdominal obesity, pushing down fat. And I was interested to make the link from this morning that because there is evidence that stress Time factors do, uh, do uh, through through physiological effects, do tend to um, individuals support weight on um, abdominally, and that is the the, the time of disease particularly so. So, increased risk of diabetes, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. The other thing that's well known is that if you intervene, if you identify people at high risk of type two diabetes, then given intensive lifestyle advice with support, um, or given a drug such as metformin, and one of the drugs has been done, it's only one that's still, still on the books, if you like, is metformin, can reduce the incidence, for example, over the next five years. So this has been shown in studies as wide as India, as the United States, as Europe, Finland, and Japan, 
And so there's no doubt really there's very good evidence that if I identify people on my risk and give them intensive and not cheap, within a study setting at least, intervention can make a big difference. But you'll see here the numbers needed to treat. So lifestyle comes out as by far the most effective lifestyle intervention if people can be supported to make changes. So one person over three to six years um, treated, uh, the, the need to treat 6.4 people to prevent one case over roughly five years. But the, here's the challenge. I want to now show you the challenge. So we know all of that. We know the main risk factors. We know that intervening intensively in people at high risk can make a difference. And to show you the challenge, though, why I think population-based population methods are essential and the only way forward, I want to show you this data from the Caribbean. Um, so Julia mentioned the Health Bar of the South Nation study. I'm sure people are familiar with it, but here's Florida. Uh, it's a big region. People think it's sensibly a smallish group of islands. Um, from here to here is about 1,500 miles. So the trip from Barbados to Jamaica, for example, is a three-hour flight. So that's a big, big region. So it's a Mediterranean in that sense, I guess. And so just some data from this island of Barbados, which is where I'm based, um, where one of the campuses of the University of West Indies is based. And these data are from the past couple of years. And what I'm showing you here is the body mass index on this side, distribution. This is in women. They're similar in men. It's more extreme in women. The women have a greater problem with obesity, if you like, and abdominal obesity, as I'll show you. Um, so this is the distribution for the age over 25 and above. Uh, overall, obesity based on body mass index of 30 is 43%. That's that line there. If you looked at overweight, it's about, six, about 75% in women, about 60% in men. Then actually, if you remember, I mentioned that the importance of abdominal obesity, or central obesity. So this is the use in the cut point of 88 centimeters, which is the American cut point um, for abdominal obesity. 61%, almost two thirds. And if we use the more um, conservative, if you like, we might say liberal, whichever way you look at it, cut point that's used by the International Diabetes Federation, 80 centimeters for abdominal obesity, and it, then it goes up to about 80% of the population. So we have a population already at very high risk, but most of the population is at high risk. And when we translate that into prevalence of diabetes, then, and prevalence of prediabetes, prediabetes is defined by the World Health Organization and by the American Diabetes Association as being above normal blood glucose levels, placing people at increased risk of developing diabetes in the future. Um, you'll see that actually, and I used here glycated hemoglobin, which is one of the diagnostic criteria, uh, one of the diagnostic tests for, for this, and I've used the American Diabetes Association criteria. And that actually is the most liberal, the more conservative use of WHO on, and, but by the way one does it, you'll see that a very high proportion, in fact the majority of the population on blood glucose level as well, on um, glycemic control, is at risk, at high risk. So really, what this is saying is, is that we now have a situation where the risk of the majority of the population is too high. And rather than thinking about how can we take a high risk section of the population and push them into normal, really we're looking at the whole population, almost distribution, and wanting to move that distribution to improve the risk, risk profile of the whole population. And then the question is, what types of measures can do that? What types of measures do we know about that we have that can actually target a large proportion of the population? And these, this is a, this is a, a, a wider use slide to, to suggest that here, these types of measures, for example, physical policy support access to healthy food, if it's done well, is likely to reach the majority of the population, um, compared to example for early detection by screening. Although, as I've shown, in fact, this is going to be a um, a, a, a bigger popular, a bigger aspect. But even if we said, well, we just want to identify how it's going to be intensive on individuals, there are two reasons. One, that would be a very expensive approach, and two, it's probably not going to work unless the environment has also changed to make the environment conducive to healthy behaviours. So this really is the argument for government approaches that target whole populations and whole populations to reduce risk. And there is guidance on that, of course, from the World Health Organization. And we've heard quite a bit about that this morning. And uh, this is the, uh, the Global Action Plan that arose out of the UN High Level Meeting in 2011, and then out of the World Health Assembly adopting um, actions. 
And this is recommendations that EMRO, Eastern Mediterranean, and PARVO, or I'm based, Pan American Health Organizations, have adopted for their own regions, adapted for their own regions. And it does include a broad range of policy recommendations. Um, and so just relating those to changes in risk factors, uh, behavioral risk factors, it does include recommendations, for example, on uh, policies for smoking, for curbing excess alcohol, for improving unhealthy diets, uh, for increasing physical activity. But as it also points out, the evidence base for a lot of this is not strong. I think the evidence base is strongest for tobacco, um, where you know, there's good international evidence that's adopting the measures of the framework convention of tobacco control, such as banning advertising, banning smoking in public places, increasing uh, cigarette taxation, so you control smuggling, can have a really positive impact in reducing smoking prevalence. There is less, good, less clear evidence about how do we tackle unhealthy diet, how do we tackle physical activity. And the, 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 it notes that um, this is intended, this document is intended to act as a basis to help expand the evidence base, that's one thing. And it also notes, I think, really importantly, that even those policy interventions thought to be highly cost effective have not been assessed for specific country contexts. So just because something works well in one context doesn't necessarily mean it will work well in another context. So what I want to touch on now is say, okay, I hope you buy the argument that something like obesity, physical activity, unhealthy diet, diabetes, blood pressure come into the same category. We've got populations across the world now, and this region is a good example as Caribbean as well, where a large proportion, sometimes the majority, is what might be conventionally considered a high risk. So we need to generally need to understand better what measures work, for whom, in what context. And I want to show you one approach that we've got a, a project we're currently doing and, and the way we've been thinking about it to try and understand that better. So this is, again, a map of the Caribbean. There are 20 countries and territories that are part of something called CARICOM, Caribbean Community, a little bit like the European Community, but not as uh, integrated or as, uh, as, as well developed in terms of its institutions. And they quote most of the English speaking Caribbean, um, so places like Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, and uh, the, the uh, Leeward Islands here, uh, Windward Islands here. And they also include Ghana and Belize. So, actually, interestingly, there are three um, countries, land based countries, that are considered part of the Caribbean, that's for historical and cultural and um, political reasons. And in 2007, <coughs> These, the heads of government from these 20 current countries and territories, and I've never yet quite found out why there's only 11 on this particular photograph, but got together in what was certainly within the Caribbean, a landmark um, summit. And they had a heads of government summit on the prevention and control of chronic non-communicable diseases. And it was actually the first Middle Lincoln region to do this. And they were, they were I mean, I think, rightly very proud of it. And saw it feeding very much into the 2011 UN High Level Meeting. I think that's probably fair because, for example, Sir George Arlene, who was Director, Director General of PARVO, is from Barbados, is part of, is part of this initiative and helped to drive the UN um, High Level Meeting in 2011. So, this, in a sense, preempted the High Level Meeting. From that, they came with something called the Port of Spain Declaration. 15 point declaration, and within those points, 27 commitments to do something. A lot of it quite general, as you might expect, with this type of declaration. Um, but it included, for example, setting up multi-sectoral NCD commissions, uh, risk factor reduction, implementation of, uh, including implementation of uh, framework prevention and tobacco control, improving healthcare quality and coverage, surveillance, and a, a, a day in which to mark the Port of Spain, so-called Caribbean Wellness Day, in which there's a day once a year in which NCDs are, um, the, the day is celebrated, and there are various activities to raise awareness about NCDs and their prevention. So the challenge we have, um, we're leading a, an evaluation of this. What difference has this made? Has it made any difference in terms of NCD control? Can we see any trace, if you like, from this um, heads of government summit through to policies within individual countries and through to those having an effect? Um, we, we have, uh, this is a, a multi-partner study involves many partners such as PARMO, Caribbean Public Health Association, University of Toronto, and, and others. And the goal I really want to focus on uh, is this bit here, this, this one, review progress, identify barriers and facilitate some policy developments and implementation. So 
So can we understand what has worked well and why, and what hasn't worked well and why? So you know, can we learn from this experience so we can then give advice that's relevant in the Caribbean, but maybe also outside the Caribbean, as to how one goes about uh, successful implementation of policy and MCPs. And to do that, part of the, there's, there's various pieces to this, but one of the pieces is undertaking seven case studies, so seven different countries um, out of the 20, in which we want to look at, we want to document properly, report what's, well, keep doing this, keep thinking of pressing the, uh, oops, don't go there, so that's, <laughs> so we just leave it there if you like. Okay. So, so we are, what, what, one of the key things actually is, is to get beyond reported formulation of policy and then reported implementation. So there has been a monitoring mechanism similar to what WHO does for example as part of its uh, NCD survey where ministries of health are um, asked to speak, you know, is, do you have a policy, do you have a national nutrition policy, do you have a schools policy, do you have um, a physical activity policy. So get beneath that and try and understand better. One, the, the detailed content of the policy, so what does it look like as a policy, presumably as a policy document, but two, is there evidence that policy has actually been implemented in a meaningful way? We want to look at the use of multi-sectoral approaches, so is it just Ministry of Health are involved in this, or is it other ministries, and it's, it's crucial that other ministries involved, and crucially, factors associated with success and its lack of achieving A and B, and they actually uh, going about effective implementation what can we learn about the process for doing that? And we're using essentially a mainly qualitative approach. We're using policy document review, um, detailed review, key informants interviews uh, of key stakeholders, multi-sectoral stakeholders, so looking at from the Ministry of Health point perspective, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Education, um, civil society organisations within those countries, so those particularly involved in, in MCDs, private sector, trade union, church is very important within the Caribbean setting. Uh, as well, so church leaders who are interested in this area. And one of the challenges we faced, and this is, this is me learning on the job in a sense, but also learning from people like many of you in this room, from social scientists and anthropologists, and you'll probably tell me learning very badly, if there's anyone else who to tell you what we're, what we're doing. It is the, it's the danger that what we end up with is we end up with seven countries so studies we say, well, this works in this one, this is what seems to work in this, this doesn't work so well in this, but we don't really understand why. We're not able to put it together into some kind of general explanation that allows us then to generalize and make use of that data in other settings and the lessons we've learned in other settings. So the first obvious lesson is the need for theory. And there are actually, in the policy and in this world, lots of theories of the policy process. And this is one well referenced example by Edwards by Paul Summerton from Canada. One that's been used in health policy analysis by this is a multiple streams theory, which people may be familiar with. The idea that policies are made when problems, policies, and politics come together in a, often in a chaotic way. One of the roles of policy entrepreneurs, like people like Sir George Ali, is to help bring these three things together. What's the problem? Are the policies in place? How do we get the policies to work? And that provides an analytical framework, if you like, for looking at it. And we have done that in a, a, a study in Barbados, which we've you know, got time to talk about. And that proved very useful, because it proved, it showed in particular that the way people was, were defining the problem wasn't the way we thought they were defining the problem. It was still largely seen as an issue, even within ministries who were part of multi-sectoral mechanisms. It was still seen as a large issue of personal responsibility. There's not a lot the government can do, and the end it's up to people to eat less and walk more, if you like. But the other, the, the, the other area of the sustained is that that's one overarching theory and another overarching theory that may be helpful. But what we've ended up going with is something um, that's become quite topical, at least in the UK, um, within the health field, and that's using a realist approach to policy evaluation. And the difference between this and other approaches is, is it aims, first of all, it does aim to gen aim a generalizable theory. And I put this book here because this is the kind of widely quoted Austin Tilly from the late 1990s when they called it realistic evaluation. Um, but there's been much more written on this now, and quite a few examples in the health literature now of using this type of approach. The key thing, though, is it asks the question what works for who, in what circumstances, in what respects, and how? And that of itself, I can just see from that word of that question, is a quite a huge challenge. And it aims to identify 
the contexts and mechanisms that together produce a particular outcome. So it starts with theory. The idea is that one hypothesizes, one generates, one to the best of the literature, the knowledge of the environment, comes up with ideas. Well, why does it work in this sense and not in this sense? What, what do we think the key factors are? You hypothesize, if you like, you test that then through the data collection. And, and the idea is that you refine that theory. So at least what it's intended to do is, is, is to make you explicitly identify theory, refine the theory. This, in, in the long run, should uh, lead to generalizable knowledge. That's, that's the optimistic goal, if you like. So what realist evaluation should do, they should show what combinations of attributes, context and mechanisms need to be in place to achieve particular outcomes, and contribute to developing the theory to guide successful policy implementation in different settings. So this is what we're attempting to do with the seven country studies. Um, I, the first thing I can tell you is it ain't going to be easy. Um, part of the issue is, is, I, is it's really clearly clear identifying the difference between context and mechanisms, for example. Um, but I hope, you know, I hope you'll see at least some evidence in the next year or two, or the next two or three years, of how we manage with this in terms of how we write this up. And the, 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 so, so that really, that, that, that um, is this still on? Okay. This is the time when Bob reports. Oh, okay. Make it happen. It's bizarre though that. Um, okay. Yes, Okay, well that's great. At least we've still got um, computer. So, <laughs> I thought some of the dimmed the lights. <laughs> no, no. This is a lesson. So, so much of what I've been saying with, with, with that, with the seven country studies, is to try and understand what works in terms of policy implementation. You still then have the question: Has that implementation led to, resulted in, beneficial health outcomes? And. I think we should be looking at this. If this again is not easy. Okay, okay. Okay. So Okay. So I I put this up here because I think it is possible with this type of design to make plausible um, evaluations of whether or not the policy has had a particular effect. If you're a die-hard believer in randomized controlled trials, you'll say, well, actually, you'll never get rid of confounding. There will always be other possible explanations. Uh, and all we need is randomized controlled trial evidence to be able to say, did that policy have the health effect that we expected it to have? Um, you won't be surprised here that realist evaluators take a very different approach because they say context is so important that knowing that something worked in one context doesn't tell you just by implementing the same way it will work in another context. And you've got to understand how it's implemented and also ideally look at the health outcomes. So I think there are approaches to this. And I've just put some down here. And I put this because certainly when I'm speaking to skeptical medical or public health colleagues, uh, not using randomized designs, they frown and they say, well, what else might one use? And certainly things that are published, um, that's a, okay, that's gone. certainly things that are published um, include, widely published, include logical type studies, so looking at differential policy implementation different, in different countries and relating that to differences in health outcomes. And then where possible, but you need good data for this, a time series analysis, and that can be a very powerful way. If you've got a policy that's influenced at a particular point in time, can you then show a difference in trend? And one of the famous ones, uh, widely quoted ones, is when Scotland banned smoking in public places in January 2006, 1st of January 2006, part of the evaluation <coughs> was to look at admissions for acute coronary syndrome in Scotland. And what they showed was, so these bars here are before the, event, before the policy was introduced, implemented, these are after, but there was a 17% fall in emissions compared to a 3% fall per year in the previous three years. And they also had then process time measures to show that smoking had fallen and certainly um, non-smokers were less exposed to tobacco smoke. So all of this added together is quite convincing demonstration that this policy did indeed was having very positive health benefits. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. How am I doing for time, Jim? I'm not going to watch. Oh, okay. I'm going far too quickly. Okay, I'm going far too quickly. We're going to have lots of time for discussion or all the extra coffee. Okay, okay. Okay.
going to function. So, the last thing I want to touch on in these three aspects, looking at the need for policy, evaluating how what works in terms of implementation, its likely health effects, is engaging with policymakers in terms of them using evidence for public policy. And there, there's a lot written about this, um, there's quite a bit of research out there. And, this, and this, these are some of the suggestions that we're coming across. Um, so to do with good communication between policymakers and researchers. So the use of policy for use of 30 second sound bites, what would you do the Ministry of Health if you get to the lift of the Ministry of Health, for example. Um, personalized messages, use case studies, use stories that, that policymakers and politicians can use. And then what I want to talk a little bit about, as it relates to what was, what's been done in Menchamps and also a bit of what we're doing in the Caribbean, is using <coughs> epidemiological models and also system models to be able to do what-if analysis. So you can say, if you were able to modify this, modify this risk factor, let's say reduce species or reduce sodium consumption, what type of health benefit might you expect from doing that? And that can be a powerful illustration for policymakers of the potential for, for a particular policy. And of course, provide cost and incrementing options. So if you do this, how much might cost, what type of health benefit would you get? Equally, if you don't do this, what's the cost of not taking action? This is the one I'm just going to say a little bit more about. And I'm going to talk a bit about work which Julia's done, so thanks to Julia for these slides. And that's building an epidemiological diabetes model. One of the things I didn't point out actually when we looked at the um, IVF uh, prevalence of diabetes by region was that you'll, you'll see on that slide that for 2030 it goes up just a little bit. And the reason for that is, is that the IDF estimates, the International Diabetes Federation estimates, are based only on demographic change. So is the population getting bigger, is it aging? And also rural to urban migration. Um, with the idea that, uh, with the knowledge that from studies we know that diabetes tends to be high prevalence in urban areas and rural areas, so taking that into account. What it doesn't take into account are trends in the risk factor. So it doesn't take into account, for example, trends in obesity. And that's why, as Julius put here, this is your slide, not mine, <laughs> every time the idea of update their diabetes and access estimates, the projections rise. So the projections 2030 was X million two years ago, and now it's gone up, even though the well, clearly was still projected at the same time point. And that's because of this, because it's not factoring into account trends in risk factors. So one of the challenges that was taken on as part of the uh, Menchamps project, which you led, was to develop a model for diabetes that was more realistic and a bit more useful in terms of doing what-if type analyses. And these were some of the desired features of it. It was simple to use and implement, had a few data requirements, um, because often data is scarce, transparency to understand, and a platform for economic analysis and policy scenario analysis, including prevalence forecast. I think one of the things we're saying about modeling, but this illustrates nicely, is, is no model is perfect, and the question typically is how good does it need to be to be useful? Or there's a little mantra that's all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so, you know, what, what are the characteristics of a useful diabetes forecast model? So these were the key data that were used as part of this model. Um, population structure and trend, using <coughs> data obesity, prevalence and trend. Smoking prevalence and trend. I mentioned that smoking is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes, and certainly in some populations um, makes, a, makes a big contribution. A man actually contributes to male female differences where those exist, or why men with lower BMIs in some population tend to have as much type 2 diabetes, because in many populations there's much higher prevalence of smoking in men than in women. Uh, diabetes prevalence, obviously, and uh, uh, general mortality. And then part of the model is to estimate diabetes incidence and to estimate diabetes specific mortality. <coughs> and this is a, a nice output that's in press at the moment. This is from a PhD student of yours, Julia, is that right? No. Okay. So this is for Tunisia. And um, so that was the UEA that you did with the PhD students in Newcastle. And then this is just showing then the trend in diabetes prevalence based on projections in smoking, based on projections in obesity, using taking into account the uncertainty. And what this does allow then, theoretically, is to be able to say if we could reduce obesity by a certain amount, 
how much, how different would that trend look? It's also worth saying here, actually, that an increase in prevalence um, in type 2 diabetes isn't necessarily a failure, because that could also result from lower diabetes-specific mortality. In other words, effective treatment will tend to increase prevalence. And that's been one of the things that's been found in the United States, for example, is that uh, with improved care and low mortality in people with diabetes, that has also contributed to increased prevalence. So this needs to be used, obviously, in that way to say, well, increased prevalence may not be, may, may not be a measure of failure, um, but if you could modify obesity, how would it look if other things have been held equal? And the last thing I want to touch on, which um, is something, again, we're attempting to use um, in the Caribbean, and we're just starting to, to develop a program on this, a project on this, is how to, whether we can engage better with policymakers using systems thinking. And this has become a bit like realist evaluation, I guess, it's become quite topical. Um, in that there's, there's been a major funding stream through the National Institutes of Health, for example, for this and for using it within health settings. So the idea really is that health outcomes arise in complex systems. You know, the systems that generate physical inactivity, that generate unhealthy diet, that lead to increased obesity, there's a whole range of different factors contributing to that. And the idea is that um, and, you know, with running in relationships, with feedback loops, with time delays. And also, as a, the, the idea is that a system cannot be understood as the sum of its parts, but has to be understood as a whole. And it may often have behavior that's not predictable until you actually sit down, as it were, and sketch it out and ideally model it. That, that's the idea. And the idea also is that policy option appraisal should be improved by explicitly taking into account key features of the system. So if it's possible to say, well, these are the different things that we think are driving obesity, these are the different places we might intervene. So sit down and do that rather than thinking of a particular a specific intervention and then evaluate this intervention in terms of its impact upon the system. In the hypothesis, if you like, is that should lead to better policy making. And the last thing to say is that group model building, which is used as part of system dynamics modeling, is it's a well described approach to involve stakeholders such as policy makers. So the idea being that you can, uh, with them, develop an under a joint understanding of the system. So with them, you can develop and understand what's driving the obesity epidemic or what factors are causing cardiovascular disease mortality and what are the different places within that that we can intervene. So literally to sit down and do that with them. And then as the, as the research if like the model this, to actually model those options and go back to the policy makers. But this is the type of effect we think these different options would have. And this looks a mess, but it's actually not so complicated. And this is a, a real example that was uh, undertaken in New Zealand it was adapting a, a, a model first developed in the US for looking at um, preventing cardiovascular disease mortality. So this is the kind of outcome bit, cardiovascular events and deaths. And these are the different things that were included in the model that lead to that. Uh, so for example, smoking prevalence, obesity prevalence, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol diabetes, the mind control, something we heard about this morning. So you can start to think about different policy measures intervening in these places. Here we've also got particulates and air pollution, for example. So the idea of this, in theory at least, is that it allows one to start to think of the different policy interventions at these different points and how they might feed through in terms of its overall health impact. And some modeling does this just at this type of level, it doesn't go to a mathematical model, it just does it sitting down and saying, by looking this together, it gives policy insights, and that's the term that's often used, policy insights in terms of where can we intervene and how do we think that will feed through to prevent what we're, what we're interested in. It would allow you, though, with a mathematical model to think about what different combinations of policy options might have the best impact given the way we think that this system operates. Okay, so I think I have rushed through, but maybe that's, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, so just really to summarise with three slides. So I hope what I've shown is, is that in many populations now, and I've used Barbados examples, I've <coughs> used uh, countries in this region, other countries in the Caribbean, um, North America, that with this type of population distribution, and here's just waste circumference in women, that really the interventions need to be thinking about shifting the majority of the population to a lower risk category if you really want to make an impact on the incidence of diabetes in particular. 
And there are policy measures that address large sections of the population, at least in theory, the obvious way to do that. I mean, you can also clearly hypothesize in the debate you know, could you have multiple, uh, let's say, health service, service interventions that could also reach large sections of the population? But certainly, in theory, at least, the most efficient way to do that is to change the environment with the militia these behaviors arise. Spoken a bit about that there are many policy options out there. I think one of the things I'd like to say is um, what one of the um, uh, rationale, if you like, the impulses for doing this work in the Caribbean, the interest in doing it, is that countries are following policy advice. So certainly, um, countries in the Caribbean are following WHO advice and Pan American Health Organization advice. And although there's some process type evaluation, we don't really understand what is working and why. And we don't really understand what the health impacts of those are. And often on a limited evidence base. So I think we should be using, as I say, policy interventions as an opportunity to learn more about what works and why. And then lastly, spoken about how to then engage with uh, policymakers with evidence, and I think there are many factors, and there are many more than I listed on that slide. And all I've touched on really here, because it was relevant to work done by Medchamps, um, was the use of epidemiological modeling. So you can undertake what if type analyses. If it's possible to modify this, what will be the health impact of that down the line based on what we know of the epidemiology? Actually, I just want to acknowledge as well that we are developing an impact model in the Caribbean, and that's thanks to the help of Julian to develop an economic asthmatic model to be able to do that within the Caribbean setting. Um, and then also what's promoted at least as a way of engaging policymakers and something um, we are attempting to use uh, and we'll plan to do this in a year's time after we've got the data from the seven case studies is developing a shared understanding of the system driving these behaviors of policymakers and then using that as a basis for thinking around different policy options. And I think it's a hypothesis, will that lead to better, more effective policy or not? And that needs to be tested. So thank you very much for your attention. everyone is at risk in the Caribbean, more or less, um, but actually moves beyond that to how to engage policymakers in thinking beyond personal responsibility and towards a more shared understanding of the population approach. So I'd like to take any questions. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Um, so I'm, apologies if I don't know your name. I'm suffering hotel insomnia last night. <laughs> My name is Rahira, I'm not from the field, but I'm very interested actually in this topic. I'm actually coming from the uh, medical experimental background and we do a lot of system models. So I'm wondering, when you get into population models, how do you test them? I mean, experimentally, even when you can actually have an input, output, and reiterate an experiment, it's already pretty difficult yes. to predict, like your predictability usually is really low. But in your field, how do you essentially test a model uh, to, to figure out whether it's going to be predictive or not? Just to, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, the, I mean, Julie has this work better than I can, but the, the, the standard way is to, is to develop a model first to explain behavior historically. You know, so can you explain, let's say, if as long as you've got the data, can you explain, let's say, the change in physical activity or the change in obesity over the past 10 years? And that, that gives you confidence <coughs> that the model is working the way you expect it to work. Um, so that, that's probably the simplest answer, certainly the way the impact model has been used as well. Thank you. Thank you. Now that, that's a very good example. So the Tunisia data that Nigel showed, the model actually started in 1997. So the model <coughs> output prediction for 2005 was compared with the Tunisian survey for 2005. And although Nigel didn't show that slide, at least on that one data point, they were quite close. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I have, I have always been wondering about something maybe you can help with this population base. Uh, there are natural experiments that I don't know if we have really uh, dealt into. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, countries that only eat boiled rice, mm -hmm. or that primarily eat boiled rice, how, how do they compare, for example, in NCD compared to countries that eat, that eat very much animal protein? Mm -hmm. How do countries that do bicycling a great deal compare as far as physical activity with countries that have, do not have the same physical activity? Mm -hmm. How do countries that do not eat meat? 
And these, uh, this, uh, these uh, examples have two dimensions. One, within the country, for example, uh, how they lived in 1950 versus 1980 yeah. or so, and across countries. So I was wondering, this is like a cross-section of yeah. the population based, and uh, it is really over time as well. Would like, you really comment on that? I would just comment to say that um, on the oil price, I can't comment, so I don't know the answer. I mean, like China, for yes, example. Yeah. I mean, China now has unfortunately very high for yeah. The urban areas very high for of diabetes. Um, but certainly, those, those types of studies are doable. It, it's a matter of, uh, so there, there are examples, as I, I suggested, as I mentioned, where you can do ecological studies. So look at national characteristics against, say, national prevalence of diabetes, for example, or CBD mortality. Um, and those types of studies are done. Um, uh, the, the obviously the problem with that type of study is you've always what else is different within that country. Yeah, but, but so is it within the country yes, as well. Yeah, yeah. I think there are opportunities for, um, as I say, I think you can treat policy <coughs> interventions. In other words, the government decides it's going to do something as a natural experiment. Natural in the sense that it wasn't the research it was designed in perspective. That could be perspective. So long as you've got warnings, as long as you've got the funds and the data available to do it, so that's the issue. I'll give you two, two, um, one example of one I know about in the UK, which is where a new transport system was developed uh, near Cambridge, um, a 20 mile busway. So um, this is a, it's a bit like a tram line, but it's made of concrete, and it's, but it's just for buses. And with the idea then of taking that opportunity, that wasn't done for health reasons, but looking at the health impact of that and determining, for example, what difference does it make to people's quality of life, to mental health, and also to physical activity. And that's, that's a nice idea, uh, uh, example of a natural experiment. And one in Barbados that may or may not happen, I don't know, there's, um, the Barbados is a lot of like, it's still really in doldrums with the current economic crisis. And it's been pressed repeatedly by these national monetary funds to do various things, which it doesn't want to do. But one of them is to put a tax on um, soft drinks. It doesn't want to do that because it's going to affect a local producer. But that would be another example if that was done. It would be a fabulous opportunity. But we have to be you know, awake to those possibilities and have the ability to but I think there are lots of opportunities out there. It's a matter of being in a position where we can study them. Yeah. Um, my name is Tom Carley. I'm going to thank you, Bernard. Thank you so much. I enjoyed your talk. I really very much. Uh, I have a brief question referring to one of your first slides sure. where you uh, list the risk factors. Yes. Uh, changeable and non-changeable. Yes. And among the non-changeable, I saw that you have genetic disposition, uh, but you also have ethnicity there. Right. So now that makes me think. <laughs> that is, uh, if you kind of control for the genetic disposition, what is left then with the ethnicity? How is ethnicity then different from social class? In social class, sure. we would, uh, the social cultural background, we would of course, we would of course argue that this is changeable. Yeah. So I really wonder why ethnicity. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, was, I, I, was going, I was looking over the slides. I thought someone might just pick up on that. And uh, it's, it's an old slide, and it's and I think that's a very fair question. So clearly, ethnicity is much more than genes. You know, it's, it's genes probably play in, in, often a very tiny part, maybe some part of some things. Um, so maybe that shouldn't be there. I think I, I guess it would be presumptuous. It'd be you know, you'd even expect a question to put ethnicity under the modifiable risk factors. Because I think clearly, like with social class, you know, one needs to unpick what is it about ethnicity that is associated with an increased risk of diabetes, for example, or an increased risk of diabetes. <coughs> and until we do that, we can perhaps place it either. Yeah. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And I am the Fatman Hussein, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Bangkok. Uh, I just want to say that uh, building the capacity of policy development, it has some many barriers. For example, I mean, we need first of all to build the health research system, we need first of all to build health information system which is competent, and we need to know the government agenda, we need to, I mean, so many things we have to prepare before before we are talking about the capacity building of, of policy developments. And then in the region, of MENA region, for example, all this is still weak area, and we cannot, we, we cannot so far address it properly. That's why we end with some sort of uh, policy, weak policy development status. So, I mean, how in this con in the context of this region, how we can approach this, this area? Thank you very much.
I don't, I don't, I certainly don't have an easy answer to that. So I think one answer might be, are there some quick wins? You know, WHO has, for example, I can't remember on top of my head, but has this idea of um, relatively quick wins. And one might be, in some, one might be tobacco control, possibly. That, that's by no means easy in many settings, because of, um, people find ways of getting around it, uh, increased taxation. One might be reducing sodium with the, you know, in local foods, if that was possible, or certainly might be eating foods. So I think, I think the, that would be the obvious answer to, are there things that are relatively easy to do and cheap to do that you would expect to help us help in that? Yes, hello. Yeah, hello. Hi, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you so much for a very good presentation. I'm a nurse. I'm the president of the National Nursing Association in Lebanon. Uh, my question is that we've been doing very well on, you know, uh, numbers and statistics. That's magnificent informing policy and all that stuff. And it's really very enriching. I would like to see how we can translate this into action, action plans, initiatives. Uh, what are some of success models, like, uh, you know, models where you have a collaborative practice, and this is really giving, uh, you know, translating for, you know, professional health professionals, nurses, doctors, and, yeah. you know, the like. And are we, uh, do you have any idea what's the best model? Uh, there are wellness centers that have been run by the International Council of Nursing, the ICN, that speaks highly of, you know, engages nursing and, and obesity and diabetes and, you know, found that it makes an impact. So I would like to see if you have any models that you can uh, relate to in terms of the research that you've done or you've come across. Okay. Thank so you. I mean, Where we can involve health professionals on the ground. Yes, so that's a great question. Um, I mean, the one easy answer is, of course, that integrated care has been shown in, in, in well, you know, in, in good studies, if you like, and the issue of integrated care, as I said, diabetes, hypertension, um, where, where HIV is an issue of HIV and TB sometimes as well. So bringing together integrated care of conditions. So having a team that has the ability to do that, and that obviously depends upon a certain level of um, organization and funding to be able to do that. One model I'm familiar with where, so if you could think about um, developing more integrated care, certainly hypertension diabetes is, 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 is obvious, and in some sense to say other things as well. You could then think about what's the best way to train and support staff to develop high quality care, to, to, to deliver high quality care. And certainly the evidence is very clear that, certain, that just training and giving, let's say doing one training workshop and giving guidelines is not very effective. And there's actually a lot, a lot on that to show. It seems to make sense if we give you follow these guidelines. So how can you build in the guidelines, let's say, into the structure of care? So can you use structured record forms or some evidence that improves? Could you use, if there is an, if there is an electronic medical record system, can you build that into an electronic, or electronic medical record system? But then the evidence still suggests that you still need this kind of constant kind of reminding and kind of uh, team commitment to improving quality. And one thing I have seen used, and there's a paper in the diabetes world that's widely quoted, is, is from Mexico, and that's using something called the PDSI, the A side, which is a quality improvement cycle, so a continuous quality improvement in healthcare, um, something um, developed first in the US. So PDSA, you know, it's plan, do, see, and act. Um, so, you, so the team together work on um, their own orbit and, and the way that they problem solve together to improve care. And they, they also, part of the training for that, would not to be trying to do everything at once. Because that, that can be very demotivating. Try and improve everything, and you just find that you can't actually have a, a good record system alongside, and improving blood pressure control alongside, trying to get all the equipment to work properly. So, so being strategic in terms of how you pick up which bits you want to improve at a time. So, so I think that that would be clear guidance, but along with really proactive quality improvement measures that, um, and developing this idea of a team relationship. And again, depending on the setting. Developing a team relationship may not be always easy, depending on how hierarchical, hierarchical it is, for example. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Michael I'm the PhD student at the Global Health University of Edinburgh. I was interested in the framework that you use at the end of your slides, yes. the complex adaptive system yes. framework. Um, you mentioned some of the features of that uh, model, which is feedback loops. Uh, the importance of history, etc. But 
I, I was thinking that another trait was unpredictability and, yes. and, and unexpected outcomes of, yes. uh, of, of anything yeah. that is yeah. in, uh, input into that system. And that applies to <laughs> policy input as well. So, uh, to, to me, you are using that model as a, an explanatory model to, to explain how, how policies can, uh, what would be the outcome of policy input. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the core trait of this model is in, in predictability. So how you could use, how could you predict the outcome uh, using a model that has unpredictability at its core? Well, okay, let me explain. So the, the model doesn't have unpredictability, but what the, the model based attempt to do is to model a system that just um, to common sense eyes, if you like, is unpredictable. In other words, or may expect them to behave in a certain way, but it doesn't. But you can understand that, so the idea is you can understand that by putting those different um, connections and loops together, and feedback loops together, and then you can actually feed through, well, if you intervene here, how does that feed through eventually, given those feedback loops into the outcome? I mean, a very simple example that's often used of, um, it now may seem an obvious example, but building more roads to solve traffic problems tends to lead to more traffic and just the same congestion a few years down the line. And that, that's one example of unpredictable, <coughs> Unthought of, you might say, consequences, but actually, you know, a modeling process or thinking through the system might have helped. Another example, actually, which is, is published, so, and I'm not sure I agree with it, but it, this is from the early bird study in the UK, uh, was the idea that if you increase physical activity in school children in one domain, then they decrease in another domain. Um, so that's another example. So, that, so the idea was, for example, you, they, they get more physical activity at school. I'm not saying this is true. This <coughs> paper that was published was arguing this, and they measured it using um, accelerometers. Then they more likely to go home and smash, whereas at least some of the children were. So that's also an example of you know where policy may like seem like a good idea, but it may have unintended consequences and not actually have the effects you expect it to have. Studies. You know, the Seventh Adventist study, for example, where the um, cohort in the US, where uh, they've got people grouped by different types of diets, it's actually within four type ones, but you always get this little bit of this thing that's found in between them. But you've got comparisons of people who are vegan, people who are lacto vegetarian, people who are fish eaters and meat eaters within the same cohort and what decent sized groups. Uh, that has given some insight, certainly, into the potential effects of different types of diets. Transferable or portable, do you think these models, if you end up like building them the system? Yes, level that's, that's a really good question. Is, you know, how realistic is this? And um, I guess there's a couple of answers to that. One answer is, <coughs> in, uh, I'm new, newish to this field, I went along to an NIH work, but NIH has something called Institute of System Science and Health, which has been involved with it about three years ago now. Um, and certainly for some people, they say it's enough to work with policymakers to get policy insights. So it's enough to sit down and sketch it out and think and that actually in itself is useful. Building a mathematical model, which it can be a lot more, depending on how complicated you make it. I think that's why Julia's examples are a nice one of the diabetes one, because it's a very simple model, requiring very little data. So the question is, is that useful enough? And I think we would argue it is. Um, it's not perfect, but it's useful in terms of making better decisions than otherwise would have been made. So I'd just like to thank Nigel again and maybe we can move to any 